So the next thing I want to talk about is Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is a uh, blockchain-based cryptocurrency. It does a little more than that, uh, but it's at the base layer, that's exactly what it is. So it's like Bitcoin in that regard. Uh, so blockchain-based cryptocurrency. And the main thing that it does uh, that's different than Bitcoin and it's really its its main feature is it gives you an expanded and very verbose uh, scripting language uh, that allows you to write uh, very complicated. It's not even really fair to call them fancy transactions at this point or even smart contracts. They're really applications. Um, that's sort of the level of ver verbosity that they have. Um, so it, it gives you a verbose uh, scripting capabilities. And we'll, we'll sort of adjust our mental model to what exactly this means, but that's uh, sort of where we're going. Now, before we get there, uh, I said it's blockchain based. Uh, it turns out that as a data structure, uh, it differs a bit uh, from Bitcoin. But nearly all of the differences are purely sort of for efficiency reasons. Okay, so uh, they're, they're mainly efficiency improvements. And functionally, it's basically equivalent. Uh, it doesn't... I'll say more or less. In other words, if you just assume that Ethereum, besides the added functionality they give you, but if you think of its data structure as exactly like Bitcoin's, you know, it's proof of work driven, uh, it has a main chain, and then there's Merkle trees uh, in every single block, and blocks are, blocks are added sort of sequentially in this hash chain. If you think of all those details, and you think that Ethereum works that way, uh, you can still use it, like you can still understand it. Uh, there's, there's not a real harm in thinking that that it works that way okay so functionally it's it's equivalent the truth is when you dig under the covers there actually are uh, uh some some changes some small and some quite substantial uh but uh as mentioned you know I'll, I'll, you know for functional purposes it, it basically is the same okay and so that's really nice for the sake of this course because what i'm going to do is i'm not going to explain how ethereum works we're just going to assume that it works exactly like bitcoin and we'll just concentrate on what ethereum allows you to do instead of the details of, of exactly how it works okay um uh so so the uh a few tweaks that that we'll just note um is that the block time is now shorter So I'll call it tens of seconds. Usually closer to 15 seconds. Uh, we talked about this SPV protocol. A consequence of uh, the changes that they make to the blockchain is that SPV doesn't work. At least it doesn't really work um, as, uh, as easily as it does in Bitcoin. Uh, there is a proposal for an SPV kind of equivalent for Ethereum. Uh, at the time of writing, that's kind of, um, it, it's not fully standardized yet, so it's still kind of in flux, but it seems feasible that it could be done. Um, and also at the time of, of creating these lectures, it's still proof of base work, uh, based on proof of work, uh, as opposed to other alternatives to proof of work, like proof of stake. Uh, there's a good chance that by the time you read this, this will no longer be true. Uh, hopefully by the time you you watch this uh there will be uh, some sort of support for lightweight clients and and there'll be some really nice alternative that doesn't waste electricity although there's a lot of problems with proof of stake as well um but we'll set that aside okay now uh ethereum does have uh it does have an onboard uh currency or protocol level currency In this case, it's called Ether. Uh, Ether has an exchange rate. It's currently worth a couple hundred bucks uh, for one Ether. Um, and it basically operates similar to Bitcoin. Um, so once again, if you, if you just think about how Bitcoin 
operates uh, you can't really go wrong uh, so it operates like Bitcoin in particular it's held by addresses that are hashes of public keys and digital signatures are required uh, to, to move or transfer uh, signatures required to transfer okay and like Bitcoin there is a kind of scripting language where um, there's certain things that you can do at the protocol level and then there's more complicated kind of transactions that you can build on top and this is where it really starts to differ is Ethereum gives you full-fledged uh, uh, a full-fledged scripting language um, to, to, to really do kind of arbitrary uh, things that you might want to do with it. Oops. Um, so there's no limitation to what you can code up in Ethereum based on the operations they give you. Um, so technically there's this concept of Turing completeness, uh, which, um, uh, so, so a lot of people say Ethereum's Turing complete, and then there's a whole bunch of computer scientists in the back of the room that, that will put their hands up and say, well, no, it's not actually Turing complete because of, of these reasons. And you can get into this big debate about the exact semantics of what it means to be Turing complete. I just want to sidestep that. I don't really care. Uh, what I'll say is that uh, the, the set of operations it gives you uh, is suitable to compute any operation that you want. So it, it provides what you might think of as universal computing. And it turns out that you don't have to, this is what's sort of surprising, is if you want a computer to have enough uh, sort of power that it can compute anything that any other computer can compute, you don't have to add a lot of kind of operations. In fact, in some cases you can add as, as little as one assembly level uh, instruction like branch if not equal uh, and, the, and then that is sufficient. Uh, it might be really slow uh, running your computations but you can technically run any computation with it. Okay so uh, basically anything that you want to code the code this the language isn't going to hold you back okay but there are things that will hold you back right which is what's the input to your code? Uh, how much money are you paying to execute this code? How much space does your code take up? Is there enough space to actually host the code that you want. And so there are, all, are actually all sorts of constraints and practical uh, reasons why you can't just do whatever you want on Ethereum. Um, but the language itself, in terms of what operations are available to you, uh, that's not the thing that's going to hold you back. Okay, so uh, it's verbose uh, and you can do, uh, I'll, I'll use the term universal computing with it. Uh, instead of explicitly calling it Turing complete. Okay, so this is how Ethereum works. Uh, so first off, it has a, a, a scripting language and generally we don't write in its uh, scripting language itself. Um, uh, what we do is we write in a higher level language, just like you probably don't program in assembly for whatever other code that you're writing, you probably write in Python or Java or C++ or something like that, and then you're going to compile that down uh, to bytecode. Um, so Ethereum uh, does have bytecode. Uh, so this is very similar to uh, the scripting in Bitcoin, where it's like these really low level atomic kind of operations. But what makes it a little more user-friendly than Bitcoin if you want to actually script up transactions is uh, you also have higher level languages and compilers that will compile them and, and tools as well. Uh, so Ethereum's nice because for certain high-level languages, they have a lot of tools. So they have IDEs where you can type your code up, you can compile it, it will do some debugging for you, you can do static analysis on it. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, of, of tools that are available to you, okay? So in terms of high-level languages uh, for, for your scripts, 
uh, that you want to write. Uh, we'll stop calling them scripts. We'll call them dApps because they're kind of more powerful than a script. Um, so there's there's two. Uh, so there's one that's used. There was one that, that was originally pr proposed called Serpent. Uh, nobody really used it. Didn't really catch on. Uh, it was based on Python. And there's another one that's based on Java uh, that's called Solidity. And for whatever reason, Solidity was the one that, that sort of caught on. And so now almost all the tools are for Solidity. There are some other variants of it, you know, that have different safety parameters or, or there's different uh, there's different languages that have different properties depending on what you want. If you want something that's formally verified, you might use a, a subset of Solidity or a different language or uh, there's there's different options. But I would say that, you know, 99% of Ethereum development is done uh, with Solidity now. Um, so Solidity is a uh, Java based. Okay, and so if you think of Java, I don't know how much you know about programming language, but Java is an object oriented programming language. And so thinking of dApps as objects is actually, um, is actually a very suitable way, or thinking of them as classes uh, is a very suitable way to think about it. So if you can think about them this way, it will actually help you uh, sort of understand and, and grasp the mental model of how Ethereum works, okay? So I'm gonna give you a glance first and then we're gonna do lots and lots of details. But um, so this is how Ethereum uh, how if you wanna build a dApp works. So what you'll do is, just like you create an object in Java, you're going to create a piece of code, okay? Uh, and so your code is going to have a bunch of things. It's going to have some state. So state means uh, variables that store certain data. So maybe it's a big table, uh, and the table is going to be uh, lookup values uh, for, for certain strings. Uh, maybe it's a bunch of accounts and you're keeping track of how much people have, uh, you know, how much, how many tokens they have in a particular account or something like that. That's your state. It's sort of the memory uh, that's used. Okay. Uh, and then what you're going to define is you're going to define a bunch of functions and the functions uh, will modify this state or they don't have to necessarily modify the state. But anyways, you'll define a bunch of functions that you can do. Okay. So the state will be a bunch of variables. Uh, you have all the functions that you're allowed to run and you can put lots of restrictions on the functions like who's allowed to run them, when are they allowed to run them, that kind of thing. And, and that's a lot of what we'll be talking about uh, when we go into detail. Um, but you have a bunch of functions. And then one of the most important functions, uh, which will be familiar to you if you've taken object-oriented programming, is you have a constructor. So a constructor basically says the very first time you... Uh, you make this object, what do you want to set the state to? What do you want that initial state to be? Okay, so your constructor is run first, it initializes the state to some state, and then if you want to modify the state, then you can run a function on top of it. Okay, so the idea of this is, uh, here's Alice and she has this uh, contract, okay? And so she codes it all up in Solidity, uh, she compiles it down, she has bytecode, and so what she's going to do is she's going to basically push it up to Ethereum's blockchain. So this is the blockchain. And what the blockchain is, it's actually going to make a copy of this. So all this code is going to get preserved. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to create a new address, which will be based on the hash of the information that's inside of it. Uh, so you have this new address and her contract is going to be sitting there at this address, okay? And uh, so if you ever have to reference what these functions are, or that type of thing, there it's all sitting there. And um, you can also think of uh, the current state. So it runs the constructor the very first time she pushes it. It also runs the constructor. And so um, the variables are all set to certain values. OK, so we'll just call that S. OK, so that's a tr and we call this a transaction. OK, and so Alice pushed this transaction and she pays money, which we'll get into uh, in order to do it. She pays a fee, okay? And what the blockchain will do is every single person that's on the blockchain, just like they validate every transaction in Bitcoin space, they're all gonna verify that, yeah, this code is okay, it compiles all right. Um, they actually won't verify that, I misspoke. Um, so it will come as bytecode, but 
they'll make sure that the code was copied faithfully into the blockchain and they'll all agree on that this is the actual initial state. If I run that constructor, this is the state that I get and all the nodes on the network will, will rerun that constructor and they'll all make sure that this is the initial state, okay? Then what will happen is Bob will come along and he'll say, hey, there's this function where maybe I can add myself to this, this directory that's keeping track of, of all the people. And so there'll be some function that's called add uh, and it will update the, the array or mapping or whatever it is that's, that's maintaining this state. Um, and so Bob will do that as a transaction as well. So he'll submit that as a transaction to the blockchain. So this is another transaction. And in this case, the transaction, uh, so this transaction is creating the dApp. This transaction is going to be running a function. Okay, and so what will happen is people will go and they'll look, they'll say, okay, is this function actually defined? And they'll say, yeah, it's defined, I see it here. And then they'll run it, okay? And it's up to the function itself. Maybe Bob's not allowed to run it. Well, the function itself will specify it, okay? And it will say, hey, is this Bob running it? If not, return, return false or, or something like that, or revert, revert the state, okay? So anyways, what it will do is it will run this function and it has the potential of changing the state. So you have this state, and if this function is run, uh, then the new state uh, will, will uh, result in this, okay? It's also possible that for whatever reason, the function fails to execute, uh, because, uh, or the function itself says that the conditions under which Bob's trying to run this function shouldn't actually change the contract at all, like Bob's not allowed to do it, or the conditions aren't right, then that's fine, then it will just go back to uh, back to its current state, okay? So what you really have is you kind of have this, you can think of kind of like a state transition diagram where you have this contract and there's a bunch of functions that can be run and all of them will update the state, okay? And what the blockchain is doing for you is it's validating that if this was the state that we started at, if this is the exact function that's being run on this state, then this is the output of that, okay? So S prime is F run on S, okay? And all the miners are going along uh, with that transaction and they're all making sure that yes, going from here to here, uh, that's valid, okay? So uh, what happens is uh, you get these like little programs and they will execute exactly as written. Uh, the blockchain will enforce that they're executed uh, exactly as written. It will never make mistakes because everybody's validating it. Uh, and even if there's malicious nodes that don't want uh, this state transition to happen, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the blockchain will, will still enforce as long as there's a sufficient a computational majority uh, that wants to make this state transition happen, uh, then this state transition will happen, okay? Now, there's two things I'll say, additional things about this sort of mental model. Um, the first is that uh, if you think of an application, like say you write an application for a smartphone, that application can kind of run in the background, right? Like say that you set an alarm clock and it's going to uh, wake you up in an hour. That has to kind of run in the background and it has to watch the clock and then at an hour it triggers a certain action. A blockchain dApp or an Ethereum dApp cannot operate that way, okay? A blockchain dApp sits until someone runs a function on it. So you push it, it starts in a specific state, then when someone runs a function on it, it, it does something, okay? And then it just sits there. And if nobody runs a function against it, then it will never update. So it can't, it can't update itself, okay? It, it needs someone to trigger a function against it. It's the only way that it will actually run, okay? So it's sort of event driven. Okay, so you need to you need to invoke the app for it to do something. Otherwise, it won't do anything. It'll just sit there. Okay, I'll wait for someone to come along and run a function on it. The second thing is when Bob uh, says go run this function, what he can do is because uh, Ethereum has a currency at the protocol level. 
what he can do is he can also send money along with a function, okay? And so he can say, here, go run this function. By the way, here's some money that's coming along with this function. And then it's up to the code itself, the code of the smart contract, what it wants to do. But basically, whatever money sent along with the running of a function becomes the possession of the smart contract, at least temporarily. Uh, so it's, it's in the smart contract's control. Now, the smart contract code might say, well, when money comes in, immediately send it here or do this other thing with it. Um, but the point is that functions can, can carry money with them, okay? So function calls and constructors as well. So when you, when you first construct this, you can load it up with money. And you can also write applications that will, they're, they're technically functions, but they basically accept money. So if you have, um, this is an address here. And so what you can do is you can just, this contract, this DAP, DAP this decentralized application is basically sitting at an address that you could send money to. And then the money becomes the possession of the application itself. So every application has a kind of balance, an internal balance, and then it can do different things with that balance according to whatever code is written. Okay, uh, so functions can uh, carry ether with them uh, that are given to the contract. Okay, and the final thing about this is you can't change it once you've created it. Okay, so you write this code, you push it, your copy of your code is sitting here. There's no way to change this code itself. Okay, this is always the code that's associated with this application that's sitting at this address. Okay, uh, all you can do with it now is transition states. Now, there are backward ways that you could try to modify the code. Basically, what you would end up doing is instead of you wouldn't actually truly modify the code. What you would do is you would write code into the state. So the code would be stored in a variable and then you would try and execute it as if it were code as opposed to a variable. So anyways, there are some sort of backwards ways that you could add some modification uh, to a contract. But in general, the at the highest level, uh, once you push a contract, you cannot change it. Okay, and even with the caveat that I described, it, what's, what's true regardless of it is once you push this contract, whatever functions you specified here, you cannot change these functions. You can't add new functions. You can't realize, oh, I, I implemented that function wrong. There's a bunch of money that's got moved into this contract and there's no way to get it back off this contract because I, I made a mistake when I was coding up my function. That money's locked up forever, okay? Um, so. Uh, DAPs cannot be changed. Uh, DAP code, I should say, it cannot be changed. Okay, so the only thing you can change is its state. Now this may sound like a disadvantage but it's actually a, an advantage, right? The advantage is that, um, say you don't really trust uh, the person who put this contract up, well, you can look at the code and you can see what the code's doing. And if you know that the code can't ever change, then if you see that the code's doing the right thing, the thing that you want it to do, then you can go ahead and use that contract. Like you could move money to it and, and you can be sure, absolutely sure that it's going to do exactly uh, what the code is specified. So it, it doesn't matter that Alice was the one who pushed this contract. It could have been Bob or Carol, and you don't have to trust Alice. The code itself, the fact that the code is sitting here, uh, it will execute according to what it does. And even the owner uh, of the contract, uh, the owner is the person who originally pushed it. Um, so this is tracked, by the way. So uh, when you write a contract into the blockchain, um, you can say, hey, who is the person uh, who put it here, okay? And you could store that in a variable, but it's up to the contract to record that information inside of it, inside of itself. But anyway, that person's called the owner, uh, but back to the owner, the owner can't change the code even themselves, okay? So if you look at the code and it, it does exactly what you want it to do, uh, then you can trust it fully because the, the code won't be changed, okay? So this, this idea that it's sort of immutable um, is, is a benefit or a feature it's not, necessarily a bad thing, although it can get you in trouble as well uh, when, when you make a mistake and you can't back out of your mistake.